Hey. All right. Thank you all for coming. This is writing extensible functional code with protocols. And um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit of myself. Who am I? My name is Milhouse, but some people call me Hannah Hanelli, like my mother. And I'm currently working at King to Andar. Uh, someone here ever heard of King to Andar? Oh, yeah, lots of hands. Cool. Um, I'm a long-time Ruby developer. I worked with Elixir for the past two years. And I'm currently start getting started in Python land. And I also survived getting hit by a car. That's why my face is all broken up. And here we go. Um, so uh, we already have lots of people working with, in lots in the air quotes. We already have lots of people working with functional programming, but however, we, we still did not have enough time to consolidate best practices, and I need a citation for that. This is something I, I've been seeing in a while. And uh, the, the objective of this talk is to show a, one very particular and very frequent problem I encounter with functional code bases and people learning functional programming. and. Uh, I'll show one specific and not so trivial example and a naive non-extensible solution to it. And after that, we'll try to fix it. And I try to relate the way we fix this problem with what we already know of object orientation. I'll show some object oriented code. And um, well, this talk is about, this talk's about code. It's about stuff we do in the trenches. It's about stuff we do in our day-to-day -day -to -day life. There's nothing glorious here. There's no big inspirations. I'm just going to talk about um, how we can make our life less miserable. <laughs> and, uh, and because of that, it is not really an introduction material. This is not really an introductory material for functional programming and stuff. So, But if you need some introductory material, there's a talk I, I gave two times now. There's Life Beyond OOP. Here's the link. And you can see at the picture, I, I still had hair. <laughs> yeah, th those, that was some time ago. And um, what are we going to, to talk about today? Uh, first, I'll talk about the why. Why are we talking about writing an extensible functional code? I'll talk about names and verbs and how those things relate on how we organize and how we write our programs. I'll talk about protocols, which is a specific language feature that uh, we are going to show. I'll talk about data abstraction, solid, and conclude with conclusions. Um, why, why, are we, why are we here listening? Why are we talking about this? Well, we, we want our software to have certain properties in order to make our life less miserable, right? We want comprehensibility, which is kind of like legibility, but plus plus. Like, I want to be able to read something, but I want to be able to understand what that something is saying. Like, if I were to read Shakespeare, I probably would know the words, but maybe not all the words, but probably not a lot of words. <laughs> but suppose I'm able to read the thing, but I'm probably not able to comprehend it. And, and, and there's something that I like to make a difference when I talk about software. I want my software to be comprehensible not only legible. I want my software to be flexible. I want to do things with it that I am, I, I did not think beforehand. It comes like in, in the lines of what Andrew told us earlier today. We want something flexible to, to express our business needs. We want our software to be extensible. It's kind of related to flexibility, but not the same thing. And that's the theme of this talk. That's what we are going to discuss a little bit today. We want our software to have production stability. We don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night because um, something happened and, and, and our site is down and, and yada yada. We want our code to be Googleable. We want Google ability. We want to write in Google, how do I, for example, I, well, one of the things that I like most about Rails is I, I write, how can I, like, how can I, create a integer column in my SQL. And then there's a Stack Overflow answer giving me exactly the, what I should run, what I should put in my code, and it works. Yeah, and, and I've known people that 
used to program exclusively by doing that. They would get the exception, go to Google, oh, that's the error, and they were surprisingly productive. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't even, I, I couldn't even believe that that thing actually worked. We want our software to be scalable, and, and this is in, in an order of priority, right? And we want our software to be scalable, but some, sometimes I see people putting a lot of weight into this and sacrifice every other thing to get a scalable software for the future that never gets realized. So, well, I, I think about sc scalability after you have those things. And other star star DDs, we want all, all software to have lots and lots of other other properties. And of course, you can't have it all. You just can't have it all. You gotta choose your trade-off, like everything in engineering. And all of those things, they come with a cost. We need to understand that cost, and we need to understand why things are how they are, so that we make good decisions, because we are paid to make good decisions. If you don't make good decisions, you're probably not gonna get paid anymore. And extensibility. Now we, we are getting to the meat of the talk. Exten extensible or modular code is code that can be modified, interacted with, added to, or manipulated, all without mo ever modifying the core code base. It means we are able to change what our system does without touching how the system already is. That is the definition of extensible code. And a good trick to, to find out if some piece of code is extensible is, is to think about code that is easy to delete instead of code that is easy to write. If it is easy to delete a piece of code, it's probably because your code is extensible. If it is not, it's probably it's lacking this property. That is, co code that hurts you less if it is wrong. Like, if, if you did something wrong, it would be easy to, to roll back it. And surprise, your code will eventually be wrong. It's not a time of, it's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It will be wrong eventually. And now I'm gonna talk a bit about names and verbs. So that I'm gonna digress a bit to, to I, I claim that OO and functional programming are not that different. I claim that the main difference resides in how you organize programs, when you, how you organize programs, not in, in, in the program itself or how you solve problems, but how you organize. In OO's case, we do it around names. We do it around entities, like you have classes, and, and, and those things are substantives, substantives, names. In functional programming case, we do it around verbs. We do it around operations. The focus is on operations and how you transform data, not in data itself. The focus on data is more on OO related stuff. So um, there, there's this known thing that small objects gravitate toward closures. Is everyone here familiar with the concept of closure? Yeah, well, most people are. So a closure is a behavior with attached data and small objects, which are data with attached behavior, gravitate toward closures. And rich closures gravitate toward objects. If you have lots and lots of contacts, lots and lots of attached data, it looks like an object. And there's an awesome and classic text from Steve Yagi. He was well, in, in, a, in Amazon in, in, those er, in Amazon's early days. And uh, you should probably Google up execution in the kingdom of nouns. He, he makes lots of fun on Java and how things, how names are more important than verbs in the kingdom of nouns. So it's a, it's a, it's a very entertaining read. And um, in order to, to, sh to sh prove my point here in this talk, we take an example in simple geometry, in, in a simple geometric system. And here we go. Um, our plane geometry system has three entities. We have lines, like lines. They are infinite lines. We have points in space. We, and we have nothing. We have the, the empty set, like the, the emptiness, this, uh, the empty set. And we have one operation, intersection. And we want to be able to intersect lines. We want to be able to intersect points, intersect nothing. And 
here is a bunch of code. Don't don't pay much attention to details, but this is Elixir. Has has anyone here shown Elixir code today? Yeah, good. So I, there's a module here, geometry and and nested modules, point, line, and nothing. And a point has an X and a Y. A line has an A and a B for the inclination of the line and the offset from the origin. And we here have the, the implementations of the intersection operation. Uh, if we have something and something itself, the intersection is itself. And there's all the rules here. Intersection of a point with another point, which is not the same point because it is not the same point, it's another binding. We have nothing. If we have an intersection of a point with a line and the point resides within the line, it does not, re if, oh sorry, if the point resides within the line, then the intersection is the point. If it doesn't, it is nothing, and so on, right? I want to read all the code. And here is an object-oriented solution to the same problem, which is much more sparse code. We have a class for each entity, right? Remember how, how we are organizing object-oriented code around names, around the entities. So we have a class for nothing, we have a class for the line, and we have a class for the point. But if we were to look at our previous solution, which is organized around operations, we only have definitions of operations here doing stuff. You can see that which code that runs in that operation depends on both argument types. It depends on the line and a line. It depends to be a line and another line, a nothing and, and a point. In object orientation, the, the mechanisms of dynamic dispatch dispatch only on the type of the receiver, right? That's when you, what's left of the dot. And in order to circumvent that, we need to use a technique called double dispatch which already kind of shows us how one, one of the limitations of this approach. All of the entities need to implement four methods, three methods actually, intersection, intersection with the line, we have a line here, and needs to implement intersection with the line, intersection with a point, and for every other type, there you go. So we have here code organized around names. That's how object-oriented code happens. So Let's let's see how we are going to extend this. Surprise, a new feature request. Now we need line segments. We need another type of vanity. How would we go in functional in functional code? We would need to touch, we would need to add another another type of data, and we need to give definitions of the intersection for every uh, every other type of data. So we added four four clauses to the intersection function, right? We touched the function that describes our behavior. If you're going to do this in object-oriented code, we need to change, we need to add a new class, segment, and interaction with the other, in the other classes, like the, the, the trick of the double dispatch. But the meat of the, the implementation is mostly happens here. If we did not have that double dispatch thing, the only thing we would, we would need to do was add the segment class, right? This is, a, this is, the, the, this is the type of extension that object orientation shines at. Now, another feature we need to implement. Now we need to compute the length of a geometric shape, right? We are adding a new operation to our system. What happens in the functional code? Well, we don't need to touch the other operation, we don't need to touch the intersection operation, but we need to implement the length operation for each of the data types, right? Here's code for this, don't, don't get attached to it. And in the object-oriented solution, we would need to touch every class. We would need to change the definition of, we would need to touch all the files of all the classes in our system, right? So, what, what we have we saw here? When we're adding a new entity, that is, when we're adding a, na a new name to the system, the functional programming approach needs to change all the functions. You need to touch all the existing code to handle this new, new entity. However, in the OO approach, 
we need to add a single object in a, in a, in a simple case. When, and when we're adding a new operation, that is, when we're adding a verb, the functional programming approach needs to add a single function, while the OO approach needs to change all the objects. As we can see here, it's, it's like a, a converse of each other, like one complements the other. They're not really that different. And I'm going to focus now on our functional code, on the, the functional code we saw. And um, if you have control over both the data, of both the, the, the types of data you have and the behavior, well, the, it, the, the type of implementation we did is not going to hurt that much yet. But I want to think now that, imagine that the, the, the code we're writing needs to be part of a library. We need to be able to extend this code without having control of it. And th the functional programming version we got is, is not extensible. If you add a new type of data, you need to change existing functions. And you that's the, the premise of extensibility. You shouldn't have to do that if your code were extensible. However, the OO version is extensible, because you only need to add another object, the behavior that how, how things happen inside that object is encapsulated, and that's why OO was created in the first place. OO was created to solve exactly this problem, to add new data types and, and that conform to, to some sort of, of, of interface without having to change other objects. And the solution to this, to this problem, one of the solutions to, to the problem we described is protocols. Protocols is something that is available in, in lots of languages. In Haskell, TypeScript, Scala, they come in, in the flavors of type classes. They are more or less the same thing. We, and in dynamic languages like Clojure and Elixir, we rely on protocols. And a protocol is a way to extend the behavior of a function without touching its definition, based on the type of the first argument, which is exactly how dynamic dispatch works in object-oriented languages, so I call it dynamic dispatch one level deep. You don't have subtype relations like inheritance and things like that, but you're able to dispatch on the type of the, the receiver of the first argument of the function, however you may call it. And a simple example of a protocol in Elixir is something like this. Um, we have two, data, two types of data, the X and a Y, and we have a protocol which I call stars encoder. And the, the stars encoder has an encode function. It, this is like an interface, right? And we are going to define implementations of the stars encoder for X and for Y. And this implementation can reside anywhere in the code. This can reside inside a library, outside a library. It, it, it is completely separated from the unit of compilation. And uh, an implementation for the stars encoder for X is just a star, which is a terrible encoder. You lose all your information. And the implementation for Y is we are going to take Y and put Y stars here. I'm going to run this code to show you how, how, this, how this goes. So we have here an X, an X, whoa, sorry stars encoder dot encode oops sorry x and we, we see a star if and if x is like 10 we encode to the same thing it's a terrible encoder and now we're going to do it with y oops it's y x ah Oh my god, where's the definition? Ah. Oh, it's, what, what am I doing? Oh, damn it. Okay, okay, okay. And if we want to encode it, the Y, we have two stars, 10, 10 stars, right? And we were able to do that away from the definition of Y itself. That's different from object orient oriented solution where we would need to change the definition of Y to handle that. We, we are able to do this away from the unit of compilation. And this is how a, a protocol works. It's like defining a method outside of the definition of the class. 
For people from C Sharp, you might, oh, that sounds like extension methods. That's because it is. It, it is exactly the same solution. And now we're going to re-implement our length feature using protocols. How we, we would do it? We would create, define a protocol called measurable. And we are going to implement measurable for all the types that we are concerned, like the line. And for a line, the, the, in the infinite line has a length of 1 million, because 1 million is big enough. The point has no length, nothing has no length, and the segment has a complicated implementation of length, blah, blah, blah. And all of these can be in completely different files, can be anywhere in the definition of the system. These can be outside the library. That's how we get that extensibility thing. And now, just for, for sake of completeness, the implementation of the intersection thing, it's the same, the, the, the same property. The same thing. You just got the, the code and moved it to the definition of the protocol. So not really that difficult. You, you don't need to, to change a lot on, on, on the code itself. But the way you use it is completely different. This is an, a, a very simple example of how we will, would use protocol-oriented code. We have a new type of data, a drawing. A drawing has pieces. And what are those pieces? Well, it, it doesn't actually matter. The only thing that we care is that those pieci pieces are measurable. We, w we want to get the perimeter of a drawing. We just get all the pieces, measure them all, and then sum. If we have a polygon, which is kind of like a special type of drawing, which all the pieces need to be line segments, the only thing we would change in that code was we are going only to assert that all the pieces are segments, and we would call the drawing perimeter thing. We don't, the drawing thing was more generic. It would accept any, any, any shapes, not only line segments, but by composing that behavior here, we're able to reuse the perimeter for a more specific type of thing than it was created to do. It's kind of like subclassing. It's kind of like those parametric polymorphisms. It's because it, it is the same thing, all in a different shape. And object-oriented programming shines at this because this is it screams at your face that you're doing this. And in functional pr programming languages, it is not that it's not that clear that this is what ha that what's happening is the same thing. What we saw here is data abstraction. Our new solution is naturally prepared to deal with new data types that it doesn't know. The way that we were able to use a more specific type of shape in the polygon example than in the drawing example. It is possible to extend existing behavior with new data and it's trivial to create new data types that are extensible with new behaviors. It is a win-win situation. We are able to create new data types, we are able to create new behaviors and implement it for the existing data types. And for those familiar with Ruby, Ruby solves this very same pro problem with open classes and duct typing, which is a much less elegant solution. It's a very terrible solution because open classes actually mean monkey patches, but, well, our software is more abstract in that way, and it relies less on concrete implementations. We, we rely less that we're passing that exact data type, and we, by that, we are more extensible. We just recovered one of the main benefits of object orientation back into our functional programming code. It is important to understand why things are what they are. Why did object-oriented programming make those trade-offs? Why was object orientation trying to achieve? And when you don't have that clear, you start writing functional code, and you start writing completely non-extensible functional code, code that when a new data type arrives, you need to change like 37 files, and I've been there, and it hurts, it's not nice. And if you're us using a mainstream programming, object-oriented programming language, you're probably so ingrained into how you, you model your data and how you solve the problems that you don't even see this problem being solved. It is just away from, from, from your thoughts. And 
I want to touch a bit on, on solid principles here. And there was a time that I talked of solid in, in a context of functional programming, and someone said, what? Isn't solid a narrow thing? And, and no, it isn't. Solid is, is, is a, those are principles, right? They, they don't depend on paradigms. And for solid stands for, is, is an ac 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 acronym? It's an acronym for the single responsibility principle, which is kind of like basic hygiene for writing software. You shouldn't write a piece of software that does tons of things at the same time. The open closed principle, which is exactly what we saw here today. We were able to extend the behavior of something without having to change it. In, in, in all terms, a class is open to extension, but closed to modification. In functional programming jargon, it's like an operation, a function is open to extension, but closed to modification. There's the least cost substitution principle that is not really that relevant in, in most functional programming languages because functional programming languages avoid the subtype problem. So if you don't have subtypes, you don't need to conform to least cost. There's the interface segregation principle, which is data abstraction. You and, and in the forms that we, we did, uh, one interface for every operation, one, inter one protocol for the length, one protocol for the intersection operation. If you depend on only on what, if you need to import the protocol for only what you use, you are conforming to the interface segregation principle. And by using composition, you are conforming to the dependency, dependency injection principle, which was what we saw doing the, the, the drawing thing. You could pass the, the implementation that you want to use and, and, and extend it that way. And so this thing, it's, it's not a specific to object orientation. You can get to all the points of it in, in functional programming. So the principles are, are more important than, than how we, they are implemented in, in, a, in a paradigmic or the other. And in conclusion, what we saw here is that throwing in a new paradigm into a programming practice will not magically make you write good code. People in functional programming community like to say, well, uh, well, all we have is functions and data. That's all you need. Yeah, like C, right? Well, all that C gives you is functions and, and, and data. And, and, and how is this even better? It is not. Throwing a new paradigm into a programming practice would not magically make you write code. If you don't know why you're doing the things you're doing, you're probably going to write code that is worse. And I've seen that happen, and I wrote a lot of bad code when I was starting functional programming. Your knowledge in X can be useful when dealing with Y. Always strive for first principles, first principles first. Understand why things are how they are. Use parsimony. Is this, is this a word in English? I, I couldn't find a, a good word for this. Yeah, parsimony, that's what I wanted. Yeah, it's hard to do this, right? If you use protocols for absolutely everything, oh, I want my code to be extensible, so I'm going to write protocols for everything, your program will end up as a bad replica of an OO solution. You are going to pay all the prices, but you won't get all the benefits. D don't do this. I I've, I I've did this. It, it doesn't pay. Indirection, encapsulation, abstraction, extensibility, it's all trade-offs, like everything else in engineering, that everything else that that matters, right? There, there's no, there, there's almost never win-win situations. Indirection, encapsulation, abstraction, you are trading something for it. When you're going into functional programming world that there has no inheritance and all those complex object systems, you are trading something. And most of the time, the very thing that we forgot that we're trading is that clear and very easy of extensibility, of da database extensibility. And if you forget that, you're going to get hurt. And I've just shown how protocols can, uh, can help you recover that property. And thank you.